I'm so blessed to be able to introduce this wonderful dear sister. She has been a uh, part of our community for at least the last couple years and uh, been leading our uh, ministry on campus through the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Many of you uh, know that uh, we do support InterVarsity through uh, uh, their, their uh, college staffing on campus with uh, BCM and, and uh, some of the Lafay ministry work. And so I have, if... Uh, always felt that InterVarsity is a special ministry, particularly for our campus, because it does allow people a place to feel at home in a often very foreign environment and give them some cultural roots and appropriations um, in an in a environment that is very much uh, unfriendly to um, people's heritage and culture. So uh, Sister Yolanda Romo is the director of Lafay at uh, the UC Berkeley campus, and uh, when I floated this idea to them about uh, a month or so ago, they were like, man, that's going to happen real fast, and I was like, I know, so let's pull it together, and she was game, and, and I told her that I wanted her to speak to us from her heart. Um, she is not our first time preaching, so this, I can't say this is her initial sermon or anything. Um, she is a wonderful, wonderful minister of the gospel, and I am privileged that she uh, considers uh, our community a place where she can belong and, and come and get encouraged. And now today, she will offer encouragement to us. So please, stand with me, everyone, and let us put our hands together, and let us appreciate and welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory today, <laughs> Sister Yolanda Romo. Thank you. I was a very generous introduction. <laughs> it's not all that. <laughs> um, and when Mike throws an idea out, you just can't say no. <laughs> so we had to do it real quick. Um, yeah, my name is Yolanda. I'm just going to share a little bit about you, uh, about myself to you, because I don't, I don't, I don't think I know a lot about, or you know a lot about me. Um, I'm Mexican American. Um, my parents born also from immigrant parents. They were um, born in Jalisco, uh, San Juan de los Lagos, and they came to the United States um, when they were 15 and 16. Uh, and they've been in San Francisco since. <clears throat> They're like real San Franciscan OGs because uh, they've been there longer than I've ever lived and they've been there longer than they've been in Mexico. Um, and. I really appreciate them. I really appreciate the struggle and um, the values that they passed on to me and that they've taught me. Um, and one of them that I absolutely love, that is not just to my family, but is to Latino culture is the value of hospitality. Um, the value that uh, everybody is welcomed and the door is always open. I grew up with eight, eight folk in my family. That's a lot. Um, and we lived in a little dinky garage kind of house and there was always like a tia or two cousins that there was always space for somebody to sleep over. And there was always space on the floor for somebody to like, you know, get a cobija and sleep. Uh, there was always, always space. And that's the value that we hold. Um, there was always food. Man, there's always, it's, it's so sad when you go to a party and you are, you run out of food. That is like the number one failure of a party. <laughs> is to run out of food. Um, and I even remember this one time uh, we had guests over and I guess I showed up to the t dinner table late and I said something wrong. I'm like, oh man, there's no more. And my mom, I just felt her pinch and she said, Callate. they're gonna eat once and they're gonna eat twice. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I think I learned that value right then and there that I could not eat, but my, my, my guests and who I'm hosting is gonna eat once and twice even if I don't. Um, so I just love that. Um, I love that, that, that value of hospitality. Um, and I just want to extend that, that welcome to everybody in the space, um, everybody who's here. Um, and I want to invite the Holy Spirit to sit at the table here today too. So I'm going to just pray for us. Espíritu Santo, bienvenido a esta casa. Deseamos una palabra de aliento. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Um, would you speak and would you prepare us to listen? Fill us with your breath and fill our lungs with the purest air of life. Amen. I'll start by saying that white supremacy has it in its agenda to pin communities against one another. 
communities of color against one another. Um, and we, we know that, and we see that, that media has constructed narratives um, that cause fear of one another. Um, we see everywhere we turn, there is, for every community of color, there is a, a threat. You're a sexual predator, that you're a job thief, that you are a thug, that you are almost achieving whiteness, making everybody else look bad. There is a threat. Um, and I'm just going to call that out right now and say that it does not belong in the kingdom of God. Okay? We are not here to compete with one another. Um, we are not entering oppression Olympics um, at all. <laughs> we are here to grab hold of the kingdom of God and open the door for more people. And that includes all of us. Okay? Um, that includes every single one. White black, Latino, Asian, that's all of our jobs. Um, and my, my hope um, is that we would be able to see uh, that the banquet table that the Father has set out is for everybody and that everybody has a seat. Because if we are only seeking our own community's liberation, um, I'm going to say that we've bought into a lie. I might not say some nice things, um, but I'm going to say some kingdom things. Um, and and I, my hope for tonight, or for today, for this morning, is that we're not just highlighting the Latino struggle and asking you to put um, the black uh, pain and struggle to the side, because that's not what it's about. Um, your pain and your, and your despair is real, and it should not be. Um, my hope is that we would understand that all of our communities are combating uh, systems and powers of evil and death. Um, that, that we may come to see that to find liberation and hope in Jesus together um, as people living in the margins. Yes. That we may know to come salvation, to come to humanity when we live as a beloved community modeled to us by the Trinity. That is my hope. Um, and, and, you know, September is Latino Heritage uh, uh, Month, Latino, Latinx um, History Month. And it can't go observed without acknowledging and naming our tragic past and our beautiful resistance. Yes. You can't do that. You, you have to name that. Latinx people embody both the colonizer and the colonized. That we've inherited both uh, indigenous and European blood. That we embody both uh, African uh, slave and slave master. Yes. We are mulatos and sambos. Um, we are mestizo. We are a mix of everything. Um, we are a product of rape and conversion. And all of that blood spilt is literally what ties me and my people to you, to this black church. And that, is, that is what ties all of me and all of my people to Standing Rock. Um, Berta Cáceres, I don't know if anybody's familiar with her. Uh, she's uh, an indigenous Elenca leader um, in Honduras. And she's also environmental environmental activist. Um, she was leading her people uh, to a campaign uh, against the Agua Surca hydroelectric dam that would have compromised their homes and their lands um, and their water. And they won. She won a, she won a medal. Um, they stopped that from happening. And just this March, uh, she was shot in her home. And she was killed at the hands of the Honduran military. Um, because she and the people, the indigenous people, faced the powers of the political powers of Honduras and confronted their behavior. Um, I believe that her resistance and her people's resistance um, is, is part of the beautiful resistance that they somehow uh, understood what the kingdom was about and they pursued it, even though it led her to death. Um, we are tied um, to them. Honduras has a history of imported uh, 
African slaves. Um, you are tied to Berta and the indigenous people of Honduras. We are all tied to Standing Rock. And I stand before you as an extension of my people who know death at the hands of gun violence and police brutality, who suffer fragmented families from mass incarceration and deportation raids. The people who have a history of lynching, not a lot of people know that. Uh, history of lynching, and we currently live exploitations of our bodies and our labor for the gain of this capitalistic empire. That is something that we have in common. That is a struggle that we all know. And death meets us at the borderlands, and death meets us in the margins. And our constant question is, Lord, when is this going to come to an end? Is this to live? Does this deserve the name of life? And this week I cried. I cried when, when I heard of uh, the young Latino shot and killed in Richmond, here just in South Berkeley. I cried with you um, when I uh, saw the shootings with, with Keith, Lamont Scott, and Terrence Crutcher. I cried. And I said, uh, Lord, when does this come to an end? Yes. I saw Charlotte burning. I saw clergies being murdered. And I said, I, I, I see, Brother Mike, I see you running and chasing peace and justice. And I get tired, just, I get tired seeing you running around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pursuing peace and justice. And I say, Lord, when is this going to come to an end? And this question rings and it demands an answer. And we're, we're, it's not an old question. Yeah. So we're going to turn to Jesus. Amen. Would you open uh, your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 3? And we're just going to say, Lord, what do you have to say? Yes. So... Acts chapter 1, verse 3, says this. After his suffering, as is Jesus, he presented himself to them, the disciples, and gave many convincing proofs to them that he was alive. He, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them his, this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, is, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. So you all remember that right before this, right before Jesus dies and resurrects, um, he had just entered Jerusalem. This is where he spent his last week, his last couple of days. Um, and he had a pretty big entrance. Uh, he was riding on a donkey, and people were running around throwing their cloaks on the ground. Um, palm branches. They're screaming, Hosanna. Hosanna. Lord, save us. Um, and they weren't screaming, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Uh, here comes the kingdom of our father David. They weren't saying, uh, Lord, save us of that, that personal relationship with God that um, guarantees us a ticket past this life to enter heaven. That's, that's a salvation that I think this today's sleepy church is fixated on. Um, that's not the salvation they were crying out for. They were crying out for the salvation from Roman rule, Roman oppression. And, and Jesus, that's all he, Jesus ever talked about was a new kingdom, a new order. I'm going to destroct this in three days, and I'm going to rebuild this in three days. And 
that's what they knew him about. Uh, he was here. He was in Jerusalem. And, and they believed that his movement is what was going to change their lives and their contexts. They believed that. And they were already anticipating the glory when they saw him there. Ya se lo estaban saboreando. They were like, it's coming. They said, Lord, you're about to free us from Roman oppression. Uh, they were seeking and, and saboreándose the, the freedom from heavy taxation that just made the rich richer and the poor poorer. And, and they were excited and, and seeking a freedom from the, the imposed peace uh, by heavy policing and militarization. Yeah. And they were, they were excited to be freed from the imperial theology that, that secured Romans' socio-political and economic control. On, they were seeking that and they were ready for that. Yes. Was this the life to live? Did this deserve the name of life? And they said no. Having lived in the margins for so long, they were ready for a kingdom, for Jesus' kingdom to bring them back to the center. Aren't we waiting for that? Amen. Isn't that a question? <laughs> what they weren't anticipating was that in just less than 48 hours from that moment, Jesus would be unfairly tried and crucified. They were, they were not expecting that. And this was all at the hands of the, of the kingdom that was suffocating them. They weren't anticipating that people would fabricate stories and lies to cover up what they were doing. They weren't anticipating that. They weren't anticipating the disciples were not expecting that their own blood was going to be sought out. That their death was going to be sought out. Because they were riding with Jesus and his new proclaimed order. And, and when Jesus comes and is crucified they, and, and, and is dead, they're in shock. They were just talking about this new kingdom, and they're like, what? But, but your kingdom, but change, and now what? And they were paralyzed, and they were broken. And the community was tired. And they were so ready that this was going to be the time for change. And now they're like, all this fighting and we're tired. And Jerusalem was not a safe place for them. Jerusalem was not sensitive to their loss at all. In Jerusalem, the next day, just, you know, the Roman Empire just went on. Next day is business as usual. Do we feel that? Yes. What chaos and trauma that is. What violent rage must have been mustering up inside of these disciples. Isn't it crazy how history repeats itself? And that's where we enter the context in, in Acts. Um, and the first thing that we see this resurrected Jesus do is walk around and prove to the disciples and prove to people that he is alive. Yes. Verse 3 says that he presented himself to them and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Yes. He sits in their presence for 40 days and he reminds them and he keeps talking again about the kingdom. And Jesus knows that this last week for them that these last three days for them have been so filled with trauma and pain. He knows that. Yes. And he sees their despair and their hopelessness. And the shock of a million emotions that would have just want him to just collapse. He sees that. And you know what he does? He gently and he patiently reminds them. And he gives them many proofs that he is alive. And these, these were Jesus' ride or die homies for the last three years, you know? And they need reminding. What a good father. What a good mother. <clears throat> Some of us need gentle and patient, convincing proof that Jesus is alive. 
and that he is aware and that he is active. That God sees our defeated bodies and our wounded souls from the trauma that has been afflicted upon us. We need to be reminded that because anywhere we look right now, we look anywhere, and, and that steals, that's trying to rob the hope that we do find in Jesus. So we need to look to him, and we need to let God's healing hand remind us. Stand before you and say, I see you. I am alive, and this is not the end. <clears throat> we need to be reminded that the only power is God's power to bring justice and peace. Yes. It's, not, it's not the systems, obviously, right? And if the disciples needed time, if they needed time for mourning and to believe again, I think some of us need time. We need time to mourn and to believe again. So it is important that you care for yourselves, that I care for myself, because we are living some, I was going to say something that I probably shouldn't up here, some not, not great days. <laughs> so how are you, how are we as this church giving ourselves space to mourn? and to grieve and how and when are we giving ourselves space to believe again yes. we need that we need healing and we need to be reminded we need to reestablish hope yes. that's that's our call so who are the people that you're gonna sit with in silence and wrestle with in prayer and ask those hard questions that come up that feel like, ooh, can I, can, I, can I say this? Can I ask this? Who are those people that you're going to do that with? Because we need to watch out. We need our healing. We need to watch out for each other. And if you can't identify what you need healing from, then I, I'll recommend that you sit and let the Spirit bring something up because there's too much crazy in this world for you not to need healing. Whether it's internalized or in the back or we're just, you know, not trying to, you know, name it. There's a lot. Let's invite the healing hand of God. That is important. Verse 4, I'm going to move on. It says that after these convincing proofs, after Jesus is reminding them, after he reestablishes their hope, he tells them something again that they don't understand. And he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me, you've heard me talk about it a whole lot. You my ride or dies, you spent the last three years with me, and that's all I did. Uh, you, but wait for, uh, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with my Holy Spirit. And still, still having their minds on liberate, being liberated from Roman oppression, they say, God, is this when you're going to make things right for us? Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom back from Israel? And they miss it again. They miss it. How long, O oh Lord? When will this come to an end? That is the question that they keep on asking and asking. When will justice come to us and to our children and to our land? You know, and these homies like saw Jesus, you know, touching and healing the lepers and talking to the tax collectors and the Pharisees and something, you know, they're just missing it. And Jesus says, it is not for you to know the time or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And you will be my healing agents all over the earth. He doesn't answer their question. That's typical Jesus, you know? And in this moment, 
In this moment of vulnerability and rawness and pain, he asks them to look to the healing of other people. That's, that's really, that was really hard for me to say because I said, Lord, I do not want to say that. I do not want to believe that when I see all this happening. But Jesus said, I cannot stay here because I am one. But when I leave, my Holy Spirit will come and will be with all of you in all Every single one of you. And my resurrection power will be given to you and to you. I will give you my power to forgive. Mm. I will give you my power to love. I will give you my power to seek your liberation and your oppressor's liberation. I will give you my power to educate and to confront evil and speak truth. I will give you my power to educate and to take a knee when you have to, to mobilize and to gather people I will give you my power to organize. I, I will give you my power so that you can do something. Come on, come on. Do to be protesters of unjust laws and protectors of water. Yes, yes, yes. Church, this is our call. Yes. What are we doing? Yes. We the suffering. We the people in the margins. We, the thugs and the undocumented, we will be his witnesses and his healing agents. We that have been stripped of our dignity and our humanity. He says, I will raise up the least of these in honor, and I will give you my power so that you could bring liberation and salvation to these sick and dying people. We are rebuilding the kingdom of God via the, the resurrected power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if we really understand what that means or if we let that sit with us. That's a whole lot of scary to me. And Jesus is the kind to flip the script and he makes no sense, but he makes all the sense that we need. We need to follow the Spirit and say, Spirit, reset my mind to your prophetic imagination so that I can see the table that you have set for everybody. So that I could see the banquet that the mother has laid before us that includes the sinner and the saint, the deported, de deported and the ICE agent, the shooter and the shot. That is the table that he has set. And like I said, if we are only seeking our own liberation, then we have bought into a lie and we don't understand the kingdom. Because it is only when I see you and my brother and my sister in Standing Rock find their liberation, and when my white brothers and sisters find their liberation, will salvation actually come to all of us. Yeah. Nothing is easy when we choose to ride or die with Jesus. But we know that his kingdom is so much better and that his kingdom is so much more beautiful and it comes with a beautiful resistance. And we know that it requires us to take action, especially in a time like this. We need to be the church. We need to be the church. And in the next chapter in Acts, we see that, you know, they're in a little room and the Holy Spirit comes. And there's all these people that gather around them that don't even, don't even go there, you know? And the disciples start speaking in tongues because they've received the Holy Spirit. And all these people are like, hey, I know that. I know that. That is my language. And you know what that means? That they just got the door wide open for them to enter 
into the kingdom and to sit at the table. This is the disciples that were hurting and traumatized that just received the spirit and opened the door for more. Opened the door for more to enter and sit at the table. That's the kind of power. That is the kind of action that the church is called to. And we are the church. Do we see that? Do we need to sit in that? Do we, do we understand the kingdom of God? It is a very deep, deep, deep truth that it is our, you know, it is our, our right to fight for our freedom. And it is, it is our job as the church to win. It is our job as a church to love our neighbor. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. Amen. So let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit. Let's sit with that. Some of us need healing. Some of us just need to fall before Jesus and and be weak and be reminded that he is alive. And that is okay. And some of us need to believe we need to, to reflect on the table, on the banquet set bed, that we imagine and say, God, who's missing in this table? And how am I making space for everybody? So let's pray. Espiritu Santo, entra en este lugar. Y habla a las mentes y a los corazones de esta gente, de tu gente, de tu iglesia. Tú has visto nuestro dolor, tú has visto nuestro llanto, tú has visto que estamos enojados y acabados. Tú has visto que nos estamos muriendo en las manos de opresión. Y ya no podemos seguir. And you say that it's okay to cry and to, to be weak because the power that we receive is from you. And Holy Spirit, I pray for this church and the people in it and for myself that we would really, truly come to believe um, that our actions and our call to be the church um, is in solidarity with other people, even when we don't feel it and we don't see it. Because that's what your kingdom is about, and that's what your kingdom asks. That we stand with one another. That we fight for our freedom and for our brother's freedom, for our sister's freedom. That we, that we receive your power to love and support one another that we may have the sight to see that your kingdom um, is beautiful, that we would say yes and choose in. And in solidarity with um, the black and the Latino and the indigenous and the Asian American um, and the white community, um, we all come to you and say that we have nothing, nothing to lose but our chains and to gain your love. En el nombre del Padre, y del Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo. Amén.